Thanks for tuning in to Insights Towards Sanity, The Art of Having Schizophrenia. What is schizophrenia anyway? What happens to a person when they develop schizophrenia? These questions occupy my story. Is there anything a person can do to mitigate or lessen the degree of suffering? Quick answer, yes. Is it 100% bad to be schizophrenic? Quick answer, no. In 2012, I published my book, Insights Towards Sanity, The Art of Having Schizophrenia. This year, I am working on a second edition and recording the audiobook for you as I go. I hope you get something out of it. Here you go. Chapter 2. Acclimatization and Affect. Learning what happens in the real world. No one should find it hard to understand that our way on this planet is in danger. War can end. We can preserve our children's access to the bounty of Earth's life. Earth and its living systems could naturally flourish with the conditions that have underlain our complete evolution. The war against other people and the war of market against ecosystem have proven that humanity is in disgrace and reveals grandiose immaturity. Of the Atomic Age and Disruption of Indigenous Nations Nuclear wars of environmentally and socially devastating radiation pollution have been tested and fought successively even since Hiroshima and Nagasaki via depleted uranium bullets, bombs, and missiles that aren't seen by the world as the same impact as A-bombs. I am talking about dirty bombs and more. Despite the public perception that nuclear war is over or in a distant future, more radiation has infected whole populations and ecosystems in recent years than the A-bombs of World War II combined. These weapons are produced and sold like toys by people wishing to sway other economic forces in some direction. Our economic, techno-aggressive cultures do not care sufficiently about food to worry about releasing pollution. We don't respect or know the ways we evolved enough that we can understand what ecosystems need. Henry Ford mused, History is bunk. Many societies of North American indigenous lived for thousands of years, utilizing plants, animals, and stones in a ceaselessly profound awareness of how to live peacefully enough to have bounty easily. There was arguably more than a hundred million of them living here, and they treated animals with enough respect that everyone who wanted fur or hide clothing could respectably have it. The animal populations flourished to the point that Western culture would speak quite delusively and mythically of untold, unspoiled, endless riches to be braved and conquered by destiny. However, things were endlessly productive here for humans by intelligence alone. Native populations were decimated, and in 1900, when the North American colonizer population was 70 to 75 million people, which is less than the original population, Several animals were already becoming endangered or extinct, and the land was already getting beaten under the roads and railways of ecosystem fracture. The path of the modern man who thinks we ought to kill and sell first and hope for salvation through science later is just berserk. Inequality that most felt. The cutthroat mentality of a daily race to the rat grinder is killing our ingenuity and prowess in the niche we co-evolved with. We do not have the right ideas in our mainstream endeavors. Western culture may be in itself psychotic and void of adequate knowledge of relevant realities shared with ecosystems and the poor masses, with laws of justice and the richest few. In 2018, the richest 42 individuals shared the combined wealth of the 3.7 billion poorest. To the left, mostly white men. To the right, mostly black women. That is what people refer to when they refer to 
wealth inequality. Otherwise, war might cease instantly. No one would keep fighting or polluting if they knew this was just a quick form of cultural suicide. We should take hold of the bounty of living conscious systems. If we were smart, we'd be willing to let our population decrease until we know how to live fairly with what space can be allotted for so many of us. This is the perspective I have today. My ideas are forceful and specific. The real world is regularly the crazy one, and it is not just me. Too many people know too little about how mind and plant nature work and have too many delusions about what is the right course of action. Sustaining an endlessly growing construction and real estate industry can be a massacre to the hopes of our children because that's where the jobs and money cannot be maintained forever due to always present ecological limits. Hmm, post recession slash depression remark. I originally wrote that last sentence in 2007. It appears the official mainstream may recognize this now, somewhat after the housing bubble popped. I wrote the last sentence in 2012. It appears now in 2019 the official mainstream is laughable as well as frightening and not letting go of the nasty grip on our wealth and productivity. People are more stressed and own fewer assets than ever. The returns from the environment are shrinking, as the political climate, let alone the real climate, is still heating up. If we careen too far in this destructive path, we may lose all ability to willfully change our lifestyles. Famine and scarcity result from ecological abuses and global changes. We do not need money. We need beneficial leaders. The more we exploit power and conceive the bounty of life as mere saleable commodity, the faster we change the earth of riches we evolved inside into a Holocene. Also called the Anthropocene, it is the present geological era we are in, one of the greatest extinction events in the geological record. We may not simply be reducing human fare, but the overall productive capacities of the entire global ecosystem. I care about this enterprise of sane ecological stewardship more than any other global aim. I want sustained friendly forests, not rapidly growing deserts. If you might conservatively wonder why this leftist rant about conservation is appearing in a book about schizophrenia, that is because you don't understand how the world went crazy before I went crazy. I have to tell you more about my childhood and life and these lefty views in order to develop a proper account of the genesis of schizophrenia in my life. I want it to be clear. My ecological and sociological views come from no partisan ideology other than a green one. Opened my eyes. Oh look, garbage everywhere. The first chapter describes how I opened my eyes to living, how I first noticed the potential to learn from and actively participate in every moment. This early opening rendered me sensitive in a profound way to the identities of others and the world around me. On one side, I was immaculately self-absorbed in my endlessly roving mind, and on the other, I watched endlessly to see how others were taking in the moment and situation as well as watching how the environment appeared and behaved. Physics, biology, psychology, ethics, and art have never ceased to be lifelong disciplines of study, regardless of the fact I did not always have the language or had adapted my ability to articulate all that I am seeing and the ways that I am happening. My mom must have taught me very early, before any conscious memory for me, with her loving embraces, what it meant to feel good, loved, and cherished in the effortless, natural, unstoppable manner of a mother. My parents always cared about and appreciated a green environment. We lived in a house surrounded by seemingly endless forest, and I picked up early that I liked picking up garbage and keeping our planet clean and biodegradable. I cared about people who fought and wanted to help settle fights and find ways to agree. I took it upon myself at a very early age to seek saving the world. What did you want to be when you grow up? 
was always a boring question that filled me with an urge of being everything I could as long as it mattered. As my ideas of the world grew, I learned more and more about the existence of past and current wars and the immensity of the struggle to conserve the environment, which I just took for granted was universally hoped for and trusted when I was a school child partaking at Earth Day. It occurred to me slowly in high school that kids thought of garbage duty as a punishment instead of a wonderful privilege of cleansing and moving outdoors, and teachers gave it as a punishment. I remember kids had to do garbage duty if they did not have proper gym clothing, or if they messed up behaviorally. I started out one day to pick up garbage of my own will during lunch break after eating, and I was amazed and shocked and exhilarated and saddened all at the same time by the responses. Some people said, right on, and some people said, someone gets paid for that, so why do you do it? But almost everyone thought to say something. The few wonderful souls who actually helped me one random day, I love you. Mother Earth is under the weather right now, and I'd recommend to everyone that we should all pick it all up. Ethically and practically, we are so called as reason capable. Humans must be the ones either to dump our junk and poison all over the living creatures, or be as responsible as we can. We're missing out on opportunity, I mean losing time quickly. To be realistic, we probably should be responsible and have the opportunity by our intelligent nature to do so, but we have a tendency to make our choices poorly as a globe. All it takes is some basic intelligent inspired negotiation. We can make a choice to let this earth flow with the bounty we evolved in. Making money and throwing litter and pollution everywhere, burying the soil with concrete and pollution, we lose out on a truly phenomenal life of expressing the self-creation that we were made in. Furthermore, we are making the preconditions of our sicknesses more inevitable. I support these words fully, and later chapters or the essays in the latter section of this book will hopefully connect my experience to that of other schizophrenics and even people in general who do not ubiquitously share my concerns or specific symptoms. But parallels and generalities will become evident later. For now, I am building up my own story. In high school, I was mortally perturbed by what I felt was inaction, indifference, and apathy on the part of seemingly my whole society. Even if people cared about the environment, few seemed ready to learn and change everything we were doing right now. I was freaking out all the time inside and gaining a desire to change the world more readily and immediately. I am ready for deep changes of lifestyle, ready to accept the tearing up of suburbs and the return to as much local farming as possible. I am ready to accept mass joblessness and the continued flow of transport energy and food. I support continuing to move our muscles for free, just so we can have the basics. We shall not keep spoiling the globe with mass production and mechanical market growth forces. I'm ready first to join a ceaseless public conversation that never ends. I personally feel we ought to raise an understanding of the necessarily fundamental general strike that is needed in order to take back for the people some democratic control of food, utilities, production, development, and media. Certainly, at least, the conversation has already started among some cultural and activist groupings. The latter half of high school was an increasingly horrifying experience as I saw people becoming cynical and hardened into thinking they needed eventually to find jobs and careers, and so many thought highly of money and senseless partying. I became ever increasingly aware and vocally active in conversations about life and experiences and I increasingly saw that the global pillage for wealth and profits was choking our planet and inciting wars of immense imperialism and terror. And I felt a blindness and violence in the paradigms of my society. Global events mystify a high school kid, not the first or last time. On one of the first few days of grade 12 in September 2001, I watched the World Trade Center towers fall before catching the school bus. 
I really noticed the apathy and indifference and a holdout on or absence of emotional reality on that morning of September 11th. I knew the Third World War had begun, and so it has, based on the premise of stopping terror and upholding civilization. As every good guy in 2019 knows, you have to take a side and hold steady the premise as justified of defending the self and attacking the other. However, at 15 minute break, our mid-morning recess, I had realized my friends and teachers were not ready to stop everything. I was quite ready to begin to brainstorm about the necessity to change the way we live. Others may be willing to wage destruction with despicable earth and culture harming ways of life, but we had to keep focus and not learn what life might really be about. We tried as hard as we could as a social unit to be far removed, holding separation from the goings on of the global situation. The task was to focus consciously on doing our school lessons and in being the semblance of normal to not being swayed by the terrible events. I heard on the first morning of this present geopolitical era being violently ushered in a student about my age remark, I've already heard enough and don't want to talk about it anymore, it's fucking boring. A fear like nothing else overwhelmed me and spun me to inner chaos. No one I heard told him or us as a group that we should care and should talk about more issues and events. People didn't stand still during World War I and II. Well, I found out later that they did, but not all of them and not in the long run. And I was shocked and mortified that everyone didn't realize the terrorist attacks could be an attack most exactly against the carelessness marching towards advanced civilization. Going on normal in a way that throws nations down and keeps majorities in poverty was the very nature of the rich business enterprise of the WTC. The continual criticism from the conspiratorial opposition to the official story has been to remark that regardless of the particulars, both the initial attack and response relate around money and that way of life that seeks to organize money. It was an attack on money and a defense of money because money is the cultural status symbol of the situated normalcy that is being globally destructive. It's not about biblical evil, terror, or democratic civilization. It's about not fracturing the normalcy. I saw all this in the first few moments of my waking period that morning. And when President Bush eventually mentioned foolishly that he was fighting a holy crusade against a jihad while telling Americans to feel safe shopping that Christmas. I mentally puked and felt the entire scene had been ethically jacked. So, a turn for the worse. At least inwardly, I started to have a continuous panic and preoccupation with terror and about how people were living around me. I faced a set of internal and external events which I spun around in complex interpretations that devastated me that year. I deteriorated into a depressed or manic state. Previously in grade 10 and 11, I was in no way as preoccupied and mortified by the state of international politics. In those grades I had been discovering philosophy of mind, as I mentioned in the previous chapter, and ancient spiritual texts like Sufi poetry, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and the Indian Bhagavad Gita. I felt like the Buddhist conception of life as a natural state of suffering that we can enlighten was exactly what I was living through, and I was reading so many texts of different faiths and disciplines to find answers. My young mind absorbed like a sponge and got filled with wonder and curiosity at what the nature of spirit might be. I was a good student in science, English, and math, and thought the world was rational and intellectually comprehensible. However, I was intrigued at how art and the spiritual and religious systems bore relevance to my intrigue about my consciousness and contemplation that had begun as a child, and for which I had no scope or possible bigger picture until those texts. I was more satisfied before my grade 12 year to simply explore myself rather than be so gravely preoccupied with the affairs and conditions of others, but I was still sad and wasn't as adequately enabled to manage my growing concerns as I 
slowly became closer to a state of adulthood. Truly righteous causes, truly devastating pressures. With the coming of September 11th and with the hyper-focus on global issues and activism that ensued for me, the world in my mind became doubly confusing and doubly rife with suffering. After all, I felt the world had just entered World War No. 3. Really, the last two centuries have been as much about becoming modern as being about a long, bloody history with brief pockets of grief and remorse. I became overwhelmed with the perception that my species was killing itself slowly. I was tortured by the fact that everyone in my small, rural, economically troubled community was tortured by lack of means to money as though that would save them. I saw my community tearing down trees to put up buildings and luxury homes in a mad rush to make a living instead of taming the trees to unleash the forest's riches of berries, mushrooms, herbs, and vegetables that could provide us with a means to locally live and trade with others indefinitely. With a means to locally live and trade with others indefinitely. Instead of saying reasonable work as a collective community in a living environment, selling it as a disposable single-use item to those with money seemed to be the only solution. I knew the land could produce for us beyond our wildest dreams of wealth. We would have berries enough if we collectively aimed to grow them to sell to provide for every reasonable modern convenience that came from the outside world. I saw people allowing the land's actual economic value to deteriorate and living for a way of life that can only end in deep suffering and voids of dwindling resources and more concrete upon the land. This concrete upon the land conceptually represents a concrete and not abstract lack of community, sustainability, and self-sufficiency. The natural environment can allow us to prosper if we smarten up. Instead, I saw people with faded interests in anything. I saw in my community suffering over bills and jobs and experienced all the endless partying. In my grade 12 year, I got depressed and stuck in a rut trying to figure a way to communicate to people what I was developing in terms of solutions to all problems, ecological sanity, and devotion to the beauty of living experience. All the fun my peers wanted to have, I wanted to provide valid reasons for it and long-term sustainability. I wanted to help out with what I saw as a failing society. After September 11th occurred, it changed the way I looked at my peers and members of my community. So many actions seemed urgently required, but not many others seemed to notice. I began to enter a daze of preoccupation about others who, it seemed to me, had entered a daze of apathy. My final year of high school seemingly had set itself out for me. I was not going to stop thinking about these issues for a long, hard time. Life changes, mysteriously fast, exactingly slow, just like the nations. Watching those buildings crumble altered the course of my life forever. I crumbled into a heap of tattered dreams of childhood terrorized by the harsh realities of the adult world gone awry. I became so disillusioned about the fate of the earth. I saw clearly that our course must alter immediately or our world would just sink deeper into its hell, which it arguably has. However, that seems to depend heavily on cultural demographic. To repeat myself, to the left, mostly white men, to the right, mostly black women. Looking around at you and you, I see, at the time I originally wrote this list in 2012, the USA's, among others, invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria since 2016 have failed to bring peace there. Instability in the Middle East has risen catastrophically. The USA continues to decline from international agreements like the Kyoto Accord and the International Panel of Climate Change Agreements. They haven't signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Economic and Cultural Rights, as well as the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. In their mad rush to run the global destructive economy faster and harder, the players in the status quo have proven to me since 2001 
that their power structures are hugely corrupt, immoral, ignorant, and many other negative adjectives. I still believe these things, but the formation in me of these concepts was emotionally and cognitively violent, felt as urgent and strenuous. No ideology had me. I had my own ideas. My views arose from contemplation of the nature of life as boundlessly self-creative and evolving toward greater intelligence, which I saw power and profit seekers maligning in their solely self-supporting efforts. Some powerful people have entered a sociopathic trance which threatens to exterminate our civilization from the face of the earth as we know it. My headspace, not a protected area either. Immediately after grade 12 began with the happenings on September 11th, I would plunge headlong into a year of examining the relationships between ordinary living conditions in my first world abode and the state of social and ecological war that was being ravaged upon the world. I looked at the rural community life I lived as intricately connected to the greater state of the world. I could smell the war-torn oil burning in the exhaust of cars as I rode my bike along the roads. I could see plastic bags and litter of all sorts up and down the main street and in delicate tidal pools in quote-unquote protected areas. I could feel how the lack of interest in my peers at discussing social issues was intricately tied to the perception there were many people in poverty-stricken places wanting to inflict terror on people in the first world. I could see the drastic disconnect between what the government and corporations intended and what the average person in the street thought about life and war. I knew the majority of people care mostly about providing a living for themselves, which can be difficult everywhere because of the behavior of elites. They steal and confine people, power, resources, and wealth for their own fascist discretion. In 2019, less than a hundred people, the richest of all, have a stranglehold on the power and lives of, they say, have more money than, the poorest, most exploited bunch. Almost 4 billion human beings and including control of the climate and the animal kingdom and energy. So by now in this work of writing, I have explained what I thought and felt prior to the more extreme symptoms and collapse. In the next chapter, I will explore my descent into what may more properly be called schizophrenic symptoms. I have provided thus far a backdrop story, which most of us have. I could not easily tell the particulars of my collapse into psychosis without paying attention to the details that were relevant to my own mind throughout the experience. The importance of the personal story, lived experience. When I get deeper into exploring my personal story and discussing features of schizophrenia in general, I hope it will become clear that the schizophrenic's whole life story is important. A story often provides an important element in understanding a beneficial course of action from the place of illness toward health. It doesn't have to. Sometimes symptoms appear very suddenly and no one can explain it. In all my research, the individual with a meaningful, interesting story is normal. My own case is really more common than very rare, even though I described in chapter 1 that I usually identify as weird. That said, I feel that my delusions slowly filled my head, and the real genuine emotional concerns did gradually overwhelm me and cause my psychosis. I feel interconnection and that the story of my past has a holistic place in this book as I capture this picture of my present being. Moreover, I feel interconnection between my past and my course and effort towards healthier living in the future. I will write in the next chapter about how I grew over time toward heavier symptoms of schizophrenia. It should give a good glimpse of how certain mental functions can accidentally activate, how terrible misunderstanding can ensue, and how one can lose touch with relevant realities that are naturally shared with family, friends, peers, and society. It is my perspective that when those natural bonds are shorted or broken in some way, false realities come to accidentally dominate. My name is Brendan MacDonald.
At 34, half my life now has been spent prior to schizophrenia diagnosis and half my life post. It's also age 17 when I was more than halfway through a four-year situation of trauma and abuse wrought by two pedophiles, one in his 50s, one in his 60s. Hashtag me too is a trend or a movement to the outside world. But hashtag me too is a statement we can be brave enough to speak about being survivors and resilient and completely amazing too. If we activate or go public, it is to raise awareness and protect others from going through things like we went through. Because, in fact, kids are still being injured by predators everywhere, and we have more work to do. The first edition of Insights barely scratched this aspect of my story, but I plan to write a new chapter to discuss it. The huge burden of stress I went through obviously reveals a part of the causal nexus. It is a central pillar of my story that real stress, internal and external, plays a major role in setting off symptoms for most schizophrenics. It really seems one for one sometimes how stressors outside and reactions inside can flow in parallel. Thanks for listening, and tune in soon for the next installment.